Hello traders, it's Wednesday, May the 31st. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give you your market wrap-up for this past 48 hours of trade to open up the trading week, and more importantly, an outlook for what we can expect in the uh, days ahead. Now, we open up to the first full session of liquidity through Tuesday, and that's including the U.S. and U.K., which were off for, including uh, China as well, uh, off for extended holiday weekends. But the return of liquidity did not uh, translate into the turn of volatility, much less conviction. We did have a relatively restrained uh, trading session, but we did uh, meet some notable milestones. One of the milestones was the first down day for the S&P 500, down, down trading day that is, uh, in eight sessions. That ends the longest run, or at least m matching the longest run, since way back in July of 2013. But that does not necessarily mean that we are going to immediately reverse course. Let's take a look at the previous seven-day runs. This uh, actually through uh, September 2013 continued after a brief consolidation. Of course, we had the strong run that we had through February, which was an equivalent move of seven consecutive trading sessions, and that did not lead to a correction. In fact, we had that big gap up towards the beginning of March. So this is not indicative of an immediate about face. Don't treat this as a reversal. Very rarely do we have a low liquidity uh, uh, development of a trend uh, that is very trustworthy. Uh, we need conviction to some degree, and this is especially true when we're trying to promote a already stretched trend, which we have been, as well as trying to reverse a well-established one, which is perhaps and in some ways even more difficult. Uh, and we don't have that depth of conviction. Is there reason to, to be skeptical? Absolutely. Uh, we talked about through the end of last week that the media is actually backing off of the uh, constant trumpet that there is a record high in the benchmark equity indexes that everyone follows. Now, this they're inherently going to highlight this because it is uh, in their best interests. They are cheerleaders for people who are sometimes un, uh, not really interested in the markets unless it's doing something remarkable. They're trying to capture attention in a waning attention market. They're going to try what they can. And even that uh, aspect, even the cheerleaders of the market, were not showing that depth of enthusiasm of a new record high. So it was something of a indicator that we really don't have that, that depth of conviction. Although, again, it's not the indication of a strong reversal. So we start off with a relatively light step in the markets. The same is true of the volatility indexes that uh, we paid close attention to. I think that these give us a different view, uh, a more systemic view of the the way that the markets are treating their exposure, their risks taking. Uh, and it certainly undervalues the threat that uh, certainly is across the system, uh, but it shows the willingness for complacency. Despite the really low return, uh, people are willing to go in for the low return because they presume that there is a low risk. I think that given the circumstances, that is complacency, but nevertheless, that's how the market is operating. The VIX did bounce back above 10, uh, though it wasn't making any kind of record-breaking moves uh, to mount a rebalance or a return or... Uh, a reversion to a mean. Uh, the VIX, as you can see here, 10.4, still extremely low. The short-term volatility X, which uh, volatility, which is BXST, uh, has actually rebounded from Friday's close, which itself was a record low. This series has not been around as long, uh, but you can use just the uh, realized or implied volatility from the same kind of assets, go further back ourselves, and this is still extremely low. But this is a record low uh, as of Friday, uh, closed for the one-week forward volatility index. So showing the markets that kind of depth of complacency that we've had to account for in terms of trading for some time. Remember what this uh, looks like in market condition we're heading into June. June is a very quiet month. Volume and, more importantly, for performance, All right, average. Volatility, from a seasonal perspective, also sees that June is historically the quietest month of the year. All right, we're not there yet. The turnover actually, actually happens on Thursday, uh, but we are heading into those 
seasonal doldrums that are coinciding with the systemic doldrums that we currently find ourselves. So this puts us in that very unusual position of how do we position? How do we trade? Are we still going in for the persistent trends, the ones that look like the S&P 500 and seem to defy the laws of fundamental and market condition physics, or are we going to be more proactive? I think the active management is the way to go. Uh, you don't want to be caught off guard in large exposure with a expectation for a long duration and a big objective, and perhaps walk away for a few more in a few days of crisis, not realizing uh, what you might have fallen into. I think it's still much better to take these markets, take trading in shorter duration. It might increase transaction cost, but it is worth the peace of mind. It is worth the flexibility, especially in these low liquidity, low condition uh, or low conviction kind of conditions. All right. So remarkable uh, exposure that we have, a remarkable uh, sentiment imbalance, but it persists. Now, some of the things that were actually churning in the backdrop, even though the markets weren't uh, roiled uh, by any stretch of the imagination, whether through U.S. equities or volatility or global or uh, there's the FTSE 100 or the Nikkei 225, nor in the more risk extreme uh, assets like the emerging market ETF, as you see here, or the high yield fixed income. These are ones that I keep bringing about for a very explicit reason. They are the more extreme of the risk oriented assets and you get a much more uh, definitive view of sentiment at those extremes. Uh, these change first typically, so keep an eye on them. But what was kind of uh, populating the headlines uh, to start off this new weekend over the weekend? Well, most prominently, we had some uh, dispute, uh, some, some headbutting at the weekend G summit. Uh, it seemed that uh, the U.S., led by Donald Trump, President of the United States, uh, was maintaining its very uh, definitive, very open position of pulling back from global trade and global relationships uh, in an effort to promote an America first agenda. Uh, now, this can provide some short-term benefit to the U.S., but the long-term implications for global trade, global capital uh, flow is definitely a net negative. Uh, that is a, a problem for risk trading on a global perspective. So the risk on sentiment, either you're going to be very specific about where your projections lie, or you're going to be much more mindful of the fact that it's going to be uneven. Uh, otherwise, don't get into the risk on view, uh, even in a short duration. But what was said in the G7? Uh, well, there was a, following the NATO conversation that was earlier in the previous week, uh, there was a pullback of conviction uh, in trade and support uh, for these countries and the, the presumption that there is an even distribution of effort. Uh, now, one of the more prominent uh, pushbacks uh, that the U.S. Uh, position actually found was from Germany and German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who uh, spoke out uh, and suggested that the uh, European Union and Europe cannot count on its relationship with the U.S., uh, and subsequently that seems to have created even greater friction and uh, a little bit more of the negative sentiment that comes with uh, clashing politics across borders. Uh, that certainly did spell a little bit of uh, influence on the EURUSD, but other things are a little bit more uh, pressing when it comes to this. What was driving the EURUSD? If you can see here, you actually have a big tail through Monday's session that uh, would subsequently rebound uh, through the rest of the, the trading day. Uh, well, go down a four hour chart. I was watching this very closely because this looked like a uh, series of lower highs subsequently on a very uh, consistent support, which could turn into a nice break, perhaps a head and shoulders, although it's a bit sloppy. It has the hallmarks of a possible short term technical reversal. And I'm looking for short term and technically oriented setups because fundamentals are mixed or lacking conviction. So usually it reverts to technical influence, but fundamentals would 
interfere. Uh, initially, EURUSD was driven lower uh, by the suggestion of a couple of things. Uh, one of them was ECB President Draghi uh, speaking, uh, actually in a, in a statement to the EU uh, Economic Committee. And his remarks were optimistic for the economy, but it also throttled the expectations that they're going to uh, start pulling back from their very easing, aggressive easing policies. That's a net negative for the euro, which still is riding on some of its optimism uh, that there is going to be rate hikes before they end their QE program, or their QE program is going to have a quick reversal, of course, once they level out. Um, the more noteworthy developments, though, uh, came from the suggestion that uh, Italy is coming closer to a possible uh, general election, perhaps as early as September, which would coincide with Germany. That would be considered a threat because Italy uh, is essentially looking for a proportional electorate system, uh, which in turn can give greater voice to those that have uh, uh, that have tried to press for a anti-EU or an EU level uh, referendum. All right, not a not an immediate uh, threat, but certainly a rising profile. Greater uncertainty in the aftermath of the Brexit vote and the constant uh, issue with uh, countries like Greece. Greece, speaking of, suggested that uh, it was suggested in a story uh, through the start of the week that Greece would uh, refuse funds if it didn't have a more favorable uh, economic reform agenda from its creditors. Uh, so refusing funds, bailout funds, is essential to uh, essentially a default. All right, they're threatening default. Uh, now, Greek officials came out today, this past session, and suggested that that is not the case. They will accept uh, those bailout funds. Uh, but it's hard to not see this as a possible, what I would say is chumming of the waters, for anybody that knows anything about sharks, uh, essentially throwing uh, uh, throwing uh, blood into the water to see how the markets respond, and then saying, you don't want to go in with the sharks, do you? So you better be more favorable to us. Kind of a, uh, a passive threat, um, but less passive. Uh, I think there's a very real probability of this, uh, but uh, we'll actually have to see if it uh, gains traction, because you can't make errant threats without follow-through too long without the market losing interest. So quite a remarkable day for the euro USD in terms of short-term volatility, and that had its uh, influence on the dollar index, DXY, since that is the major uh, major currency cross, though it didn't translate evenly across to all the dollar-based pairs. But this euro USD was arguably one of the bigger movers on the session. Another one that has proven quite uh, market-moving, uh, though you can't really see it on the daily chart with the scale of inactivity that we've had, uh, but if you look at the four-hour chart or even lower, uh, the one-hour chart, you see a little bit more activity. Uh, noteworthy was, as of last week, we had that big drop from the pound dollar, that the pound losing significant traction, on uh, the polls from YouGov suggesting that uh, the lead from Prime Minister Theresa May's party in the lead up to the general election had dropped from 12 percentage points to 5. Well, as of the start of this week, uh, there was a ICM poll that suggested that uh, the uh, actual lead from uh, the Tories was uh, wider than that. All right, so uh, re rebuking some of that uh, concern. But this is the nature of polls, and as we warned until the end of last week, the market sensitivity to them, especially in the aftermath of Brexit or a U.S. election, uh, and what the stakes are here. Uh, there was another poll that was quoted by uh, the Times in London uh, that YouGov data suggested that uh, Prime Minister Theresa May's party would fall 16, shorts of a, uh, 16 seats short of a majority, which mean that mandate for easier uh, influence and easier dictation of negotiation position in the Brexit uh, was going to be that much more complicated. All right, so it would be a general election without the favorable outcome. All right, that pushed the pound back a little bit, the cable. Uh, keep an eye uh, on uh, levels here. I do think that there is something to be said of this 127.50 level as a support. Let's increase its darkness here. Uh, 
I'll be watching this. All right, that's previous resistance, now new support. Uh, we'll see if it gets guidelines, but remember, just breaking technical boundaries nowadays is not enough. We need something that promotes conviction for follow through. Is there enough to promote follow through from the pound? Uh, it remains to be seen. Uh, we'll have to see what the polls suggest and how markets uh, act and re react to them. Now, the pound dollar is not the only cross that uh, you should keep in mind. Uh, I think that most prominent for the discussion of back and forth on Brexit, Euro pound is a great pair. And if you want to combine some more technicals with it, pound Kiwi, pound Aussie, and pound CAD are more than uh, capable of generating some interesting charts. Uh, pound Aussie at the moment is the more uh, interesting uh, confluence of technical levels. So keeping an eye distinctly set here, especially with the, the consistency of this descending trend channel into support at about one, uh, 171.40 or 171.25. Now, one market that has been active and now seems to be a little bit more restrained, so the opposite of the pound, is Bitcoin. I did a special report on Bitcoin to start off this trading week. Uh, you can check it out on Daily FX. But uh, the consistent surge that we had through last week has started to ebb. Uh, and that's a reflection of the drivers that had uh, mounted at one point a doubling of this cryptocurrency uh, from open to high. We still retain a lot of the volatility, but we're losing the consistency of direction or conviction. And that's what we usually expect when we see speculators are heavily uh, motivating such a run. If this was an uptake of blockchain technology, which is a long way off but holds considerable promise, I would think that this has very strong consistency opportunity. Uh, but the pace of this rise uh, doesn't look like the... Uh, promotion of this uh, systemic shift, and certainly we didn't get the pace of change that that would insinuate. Uh, the appeal of institutions, including uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies into funds and such, could be another aspect, uh, but uh, that too is dependent upon uh, what they believe is blockchain or a wholesale speculative uptake, uh, which once again gets it down to speculation. Uh, averting or avoiding capital controls is a possibility, but there aren't uh, any uh, distinct uh, flare-ups in volume in particular regions around the world, and the big players uh, like China are certainly cracking down on these efforts to circumvent the capital controls. So I think this has a lot to do with just pure speculation, people seeing the rise in population popularity of something like this, especially in a millennial uh, investor sense, this is something that they can see a value for in a modern finance uh, and dynamic world where it's been very stodgy and slow to change and to adapt to the realities, and subsequently a lot of speculative funds chasing it in. But those speculative funds are only so uh, rich. They can they don't have the deepest pockets that they can uh, maintain markets consistently. And if something starts to fall apart, uh, they're what we consider weak hands. All right? Not that they're poor investors. It's just that they usually are more responsive, more reactive. And when they are a collective of more reactive traders, sees a market pullback, they're more likely to pull off and subsequently generate volatility and a correction. So. Keep a close eye on Bitcoin. I think this has lots of long-term appeal, short-term volatility, and a lot of questions in between. This is a, a very strong statement on so many aspects of the financial system, and it should be in our regular review of the markets. All right, so in the next 24 hours, obviously, as liquidity continues to fill out, we're going to have to keep a close eye on risk trends. I think that this slow start to the week may be indicative of the market uh, simply treating this as kind of the lull of the year. But I, uh, it's not worth growing complacent and treating this as, let's say, the 2014 summer lull or even the 2016 summer lull. There is so thin liquidity. There's so much leverage in the exposure that the markets have that if we have a serious problem, it is going to uh, very likely see a extreme deleveraging. So be very mindful of the risks that this represents. 
and be uh, reactive, uh, be flexible. And what I have to remind myself of all the time is uh, fundamental uh, interpretation, motivations can change quickly amongst uh, such a flippant crowd, and I have to be ready to accept that and reevaluate from the way that they're seeing it. This is the kind of markets that we're dealing with, especially with the market participants. But in terms of tangible event risk, uh, the docket has quite a few pieces of event risk, but I think that uh, some of the most concentrated is actually going to center upon the emerging markets. Here's the emerging market ETF. All right, lots of gaps. It's actually... We'll turn it to an area. All right, so we want to see some consistency in this because we, we've hit our head on some very noteworthy resistance here. Follow through beyond the 42 level is going to require some degree of conviction. Now, conviction is very tough to come by in emerging markets because you really have to be convinced that the otherwise very risky uh, area of investment is stable or there is just a such a a questionless rise in appetite for yield that people will ignore the risks. Uh, but we have plenty of reason to truly evaluate the uncertainties, especially as it uh, as it runs by the the docket. Looking at the docket for the next 24 hours, we have some very noteworthy emerging market stuff. Uh, Chinese PMI obviously is uh, an important one, but I'm more interested in the Indian GDP figures for the first quarter. Actually, we also have a, have the Brazilian GDP figures on Thursday. Uh, but we also have the Brazilian Central Bank rate decision, which is expected to end with a 100 basis point rate cut. If you recall, the USD BRL, which is the Brazilian real, had a massive sur surge because there was the return of political instability or political questions uh, in the country uh, not too long ago, which led to that very aggressive move. So stability is always going to be a question here. The, the markets have been very good at ignoring fundamentally important events, but uh, they've also proven quite unstable. And though risk trends have been very, very remarkably consistent and passive, I would not uh, ignore the possibility of seeing something as risky uh, and far out the curve, if you will, as the emerging markets seeing a big move and uh, essentially spilling down the spectrum, taking down equities, global and U.S., commodities, high yield, everything else with it. So be mindful. These are these types of markets. Now, other scheduled event risk of a very definitive nature includes, uh, well, we have the uh, UK sentiment surveys, which will be out by the time this is out. Uh, we have small business confidence from Japan, very important for jobs and wages, uh, though uh, the Japanese yen uh, has not been very responsive to its own fundamentals, and even equities have not been very responsive. Employment from Germany and Eurozone is economically important, but it hasn't... It, tapped into one of the more uh, motivating themes as of late. can generate some short-term volatility, though, so do, do keep an eye on it. Canadian GDP. The Canadian uh, data has been a little bit more capable of generating volatility. Uh, DollarCAD has been tracking out very well uh, the motivations of oil. In fact, if we were to, and we will... Uh, we'll overlay the inverse of uh, crude oil here. And you can see that it has been generally following out the swings. So this is where most of its motivation has come from, but uh, given the circumstances of definitive technical boundaries and uh, short-term volatility in response to some of this data, like BOC rate decision, Canadian employment figures, I think the GDP figures can certainly live up to the task so long as there is a su substantial enough surprise. So if you're trading anything CAD-related, do be mindful of the event risk. Now, the U.S. deserves special attention from the docket over the next 24 hours, even though it looks like it's relatively quiet for a couple of reasons. One, this past session had uh, its fair share of event risk. We had uh, housing figures, which were good. We had personal income and spending, which was positive 0.4% on each. Uh, but the favored inflation figure from uh, the U.S. Uh, is still showing a very temperate 
view of inflation pressures, which is the motivation for rate hikes. That curbs expectations that rate hikes can't can be consistent and subsequently encourage uh, the Fed to start backing off of its uh, balance sheet, which is the big next stage. Also, U.S. consumer confidence softened, and this gives us that mixed view of all right, just how much sentiment is going to lead to tangible growth. Now, that being said, Fed speak is going to continue. Uh, Kaplan is a hawk, all right, or at least he's become more of a hawk. Uh, we've had this past week, or this past session, sorry, uh, some more dovish remarks from Bernard, although she did uh, come out with the suggestion that she does see the, the argument for more rate hikes. I guess that's as much as we're going to get from her. Uh, but noteworthy here, and it's a medium unbolded on my calendar, but the Fed's beige book. The beige book comes out two weeks before the FOMC rate decision. All right, so start your countdown. The probability of a Fed rate hike at the next meeting early June is somewhere around 84% if you look at the uh, Fed watch from this, uh, the CBOE or CME. Uh, we'll see how much influence this can actually carry with the U.S. dollar. Uh, does the dollar actually follow interest rate expectations? Is that the motivator? And if so, uh, as was very uh, poignantly asked in the uh, Q&A, why is the Euro USD not simply dropping? as the ECB maintains its QE program and the Fed talks about rate hikes and possibly a reduction in its balance sheet. Obviously, this is not a straightforward driver. This is not the key catalyst for the dollar and, in turn, Euro, USD, and other uh, dollar-based majors. All right, so watch activity levels, watch conviction, watch event risk. A lot going on in the markets, but it's not the trends that we would prefer, most of us as traders, uh, but rather measured discrete moves, which can definitely be taken advantage of if you tra uh, trade with the right approach. All right, we'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next rundown of these markets tomorrow. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out here.